Good evening. At Christmas time, every home takes on a special beauty, a special warmth. And that's certainly true of the White House, where so many famous Americans have spent their Christmases over the years. This fine old home, the People's House, has seen so much, been so much a part of all our lives and history. It's been humbling and inspiring for Nancy and me to be spending our first Christmas in this place. We've lived here as your tenants for almost a year now. And what a year it's been. As a people, we've been through quite a lot. Moments of joy, of tragedy, and of real achievement. Moments that I believe have brought us all closer together. G.K. Chesterton once said that the world would never starve for wonders, but only for the want of wonder. At this special time of year, we all renew our sense of wonder in recalling the story of the first Christmas in Bethlehem nearly 2,000 years ago. Some celebrate Christmas as the birthday of a great and good philosopher and teacher. Others of us believe in the divinity of the child born in Bethlehem, that he was and is the promised Prince of Peace. Yes, we've questioned why he who could perform miracles chose to come among us as a helpless babe. But maybe that was his first miracle, his first great lesson that we should learn to care for one another. Tonight, in millions of American homes, the glow of the Christmas tree is a reflection of the love Jesus taught us. Like the shepherds and wise men of that first Christmas, we Americans have always tried to follow a higher light, a star, if you will. At lonely campfire vigils along the frontier, in the darkest days of the Great Depression, through war and peace, the twin beacons of faith and freedom have brightened the American sky. At times, our footsteps may have faltered, but trusting in God's help, we've never lost our way. Just across the way from the White House stand the two great emblems of the holiday season, a menorah symbolizing the Jewish festival of Hanukkah and the national Christmas tree, a beautiful towering blue spruce from Pennsylvania. Like the national Christmas tree, our country is a living, growing thing planted in rich American soil. Only our devoted care can bring it to full flower. So let this holiday season be for us a time of rededication. Even as we rejoice, however, let us remember that for some Americans, this will not be as happy a Christmas as it should be. I know a little of what they feel. I remember one Christmas Eve during the Great Depression, my father opening what he thought was a Christmas greeting. It was a notice that he no longer had a job. Over the past year, we've begun the long, hard work of economic recovery. Our goal is an America in which every citizen who needs and wants a job can get a job. Our program for recovery has only been in place for 12 weeks now, but it is beginning to work. With your help and prayers, it will succeed. We're winning the battle against inflation, runaway government spending, and taxation. And that victory will mean more economic growth, more jobs, and more opportunity for all Americans. A few months before he took up residence in this house, one of my predecessors, John Kennedy, tried to sum up the temper of the times with a quote from an author closely tied to Christmas, Charles Dickens. We were living, he said, in the best of times and the worst of times. Well, in some ways, that's even more true today. The world is full of peril as well as promise. Too many of its people, even now, live in the shadow of want and tyranny. As I speak to you tonight, the fate of a proud and ancient nation hangs in the balance. For a thousand years, Christmas has been celebrated in Poland, a land of deep religious faith. But this Christmas brings little joy to the courageous Polish people. They have been betrayed by their own government. The men who rule them and their totalitarian allies fear the very freedom that the Polish people cherish. They have answered the stirrings of liberty with brute force, killings, mass arrests, and the setting up of concentration camps. Lech Walesa and other solidarity leaders are imprisoned, their fate unknown. Factories, mines, universities, and homes have been assaulted. The Polish government has trampled underfoot solemn commitments to the UN Charter and the Helsinki Accords. It has even broken the Gdansk Agreement of August 1980, by which the Polish government recognized the basic right of its people to form free trade unions and to strike. The tragic events now occurring in Poland almost two years to the day 
after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan have been precipitated by public and secret pressure from the Soviet Union. It is no coincidence that Soviet Marshal Kulikov, chief of the Warsaw Pact forces, and other senior Red Army officers were in Poland while these outrages were being initiated. And it is no coincidence that the martial law proclamations imposed in December by the Polish government were being printed in the Soviet Union in September. The target of this depression is the solidarity movement. But in attacking solidarity, its enemies attack an entire people. 10 million of Poland's 36 million citizens are members of solidarity. Taken together with their families, they account for the overwhelming majority of the Polish nation. By persecuting solidarity, the Polish government wages war against its own people. I urge the Polish government and its allies to consider the consequences of their actions. How can they possibly justify using naked force to crush a people who ask for nothing more than the right to lead their own lives in freedom and dignity? Brute force may intimidate, but it cannot form the basis of an enduring society, and the ailing Polish economy cannot be rebuilt with terror tactics. Poland needs cooperation between its government and its people, not military oppression. If the Polish government will honor the commitments it has made to basic human rights in documents like the Gdansk Agreement, we in America will gladly do our share to help the shattered Polish economy just as we helped the countries of Europe after both world wars. It's ironic that we offered and Poland expressed interest in accepting our help after World War II. The Soviet Union intervened then and refused to allow such help to Poland. But if the forces of tyranny in Poland and those who incite them from without do not relent, they should prepare themselves for serious consequences. Already, Throughout the free world, citizens have publicly demonstrated their support for the Polish people. Our government and those of our allies have expressed moral revulsion at the police state tactics of Poland's oppressors. The church has also spoken out in spite of threats and intimidation. But our reaction cannot stop there. I want emphatically to state tonight that if the outrages in Poland do not cease, we cannot and will not conduct business as usual with the perpetrators and those who aid and abet them. Make no mistake, their crime will cost them dearly in their future dealings with America and free peoples everywhere. I do not make this statement lightly or without serious reflection. We have been measured and deliberate in our reaction to the tragic events in Poland. We have not acted in haste. And the steps I will outline tonight and others we may take in the days ahead are firm, just, and reasonable. In order to aid the suffering Polish people during this critical period, we will continue the shipment of food through private humanitarian channels, but only so long as we know that the Polish people themselves receive the food. The neighboring country of Austria has opened her doors to refugees from Poland. I have therefore directed that American assistance, including supplies of basic foodstuffs, be offered to aid the Austrians in providing for these refugees. But to underscore our fundamental opposition to the repressive actions taken by the Polish government against its own people, the administration has suspended all government-sponsored shipments of agricultural and dairy products to the Polish government. This suspension will remain in force until absolute assurances are received that distribution of these products is monitored and guaranteed by independent agencies. We must be sure that every bit of food provided by America goes to the Polish people, not to their oppressors. The United States is taking immediate action to suspend major elements of our economic relationships with the Polish government. We have halted the renewal of the Export-Import Bank's line of export credit insurance to the Polish government. We will suspend Polish civil aviation privileges in the United States. We are suspending the right of Poland's fishing fleet to operate in American waters. And we're proposing to our allies the further restriction of high technology exports to Poland. These actions are not directed against the Polish people. They are a warning to the government of Poland that free men cannot and will not stand idly by in the face of brutal repression. To underscore this point, I've written a letter to General Jaruzelski, head of the Polish government, 
In it, I outlined the steps we're taking and warned of the serious consequences if the Polish government continues to use violence against its populace. I've urged him to free those in arbitrary detention, to lift martial law, and to restore the internationally recognized rights of the Polish people to free speech and association. The Soviet Union, through its threats and pressures, deserves a major share of blame for the developments in Poland. So I have also sent a letter to President Brezhnev, urging him to permit the restoration of basic human rights in Poland provided for in the Helsinki Final Act. In it, I informed him that if this repression continues, the United States will have no choice but to take further concrete political and economic measures affecting our relationship. When 19th century Polish patriots rose against foreign oppressors, their rallying cry was, for our freedom and yours. Well, that motto still rings true in our time. There is a spirit of solidarity abroad in the world tonight that no physical force can crush. It crosses national boundaries and enters into the hearts of men and women everywhere. In factories, farms, and schools, in cities and towns around the globe, we, the people of the free world, stand as one with our Polish brothers and sisters. Their cause is ours, and our prayers and hopes go out to them this Christmas. Yesterday, I met in this very room with Romuald Spasowski, the distinguished former Polish ambassador who has sought asylum in our country in protest to the suppression of his native land. He told me that one of the ways the Polish people have demonstrated their solidarity in the face of martial law is by placing lighted candles in their windows to show that the light of liberty still glows in their hearts. Ambassador Spasowski requested that on Christmas Eve, a lighted candle will burn in the White House window as a small but certain beacon of our solidarity with the Polish people. I urge all of you to do the same tomorrow night on Christmas Eve as a personal statement of your commitment to the steps we're taking to support the brave people of Poland in their time of troubles. Once earlier in this century, an evil influence threatened that the lights were going out all over the world. Let the light of millions of candles in American homes give notice that the light of freedom is not going to be extinguished. We're blessed with a freedom and abundance denied to so many. Let those candles remind us that these blessings bring with them a solid obligation, an obligation to the God who guides us, an obligation to the heritage of liberty and dignity handed down to us by our forefathers, and an obligation to the children of the world whose future will be shaped by the way we live our lives today. Christmas means so much because of one special child, but Christmas also reminds us that all children are special, that they are gifts from God, gifts beyond price that mean more than any presents money can buy. In their love and laughter, in our hopes for their future, lies the true meaning of Christmas. So, in a spirit of gratitude for what we've been able to achieve together over the past year, and looking forward to all that we hope to achieve together in the years ahead, Nancy and I want to wish you all the best of holiday seasons. As Charles Dickens, whom I quoted a few moments ago, said so well in A Christmas Carol, God bless us, everyone. Merry Christmas from the White House. Nancy and I wish we could personally thank the thousands of you who sent us holiday cards, greetings, and messages. Each one is moving and tells a story of its own. A story of love, hope, prayer, and patriotism. And each one has helped to brighten our Christmas. Some of the most moving have come from fellow citizens who, unlike most of us, are not spending Christmas Day at the family hearth, surrounded by friends and loved ones. I'm thinking of the 12 U.S. Marines who sent us a card from Beirut, Lebanon, where they'll spend their Christmas helping to rebuild the shattered hopes for peace in a suffering land. And I'm thinking of the petty officer serving aboard the USS Enterprise, who asked that we remember him and his shipmates this holiday season. Christmas in the Indian Ocean is no fun, he writes, but it's for a very good cause. Well, that's right, sailor. You're serving a very good cause indeed. On this, the birthday of the Prince of Peace, you and your comrades serve to protect the peace he taught us. You may be thousands of miles away, but to us here at home, 
you've never been closer. One of my favorite pieces of Christmas mail came early this year, a sort of modern American Christmas story that took place not in our country's heartland, but on the troubled waters of the South China Sea last October. To me, it sums up so much of what is best about the Christmas spirit, the American character, and what this beloved land of ours stands for, not only to ourselves, but to millions of less fortunate people around the globe. I want to thank Mr. Gary Kemp of Nina, Wisconsin, for bringing it to my attention. It's a letter from Ordnance Man First Class John Mooney, written to his parents from aboard the aircraft carrier Midway on October 15th, but it's a true Christmas story in the best sense. Dear Mom and Dad, he wrote, Today we spotted a boat in the water and we rendered assistance. We picked up 65 Vietnamese refugees. It was about a two-hour job getting everyone aboard, and then they had to get screened by intelligence and checked out by medical and fed and clothed and all that. But now they're resting on the hangar deck, and the kids, most of them seem to be kids, are sitting in front of probably the first television set they've ever seen watching Star Wars. Their boat was sinking as we came alongside. They'd been at sea five days and had run out of water. All in all, a couple of more days, and the kids would have been in pretty bad shape. I guess once in a while, he writes, we need a jolt like that for us to realize why we do what we do and how important really it can be. I mean, it took a lot of guts for those parents to make a choice like that, to go to sea in a leaky boat in hope of finding someone to take them from the sea. So much risk, but apparently they felt it was worth it rather than live in a communist country. For all of our problems with the price of gas and not being able to afford a new car or other creature comforts this year, I really don't see a lot of leaky boats heading out of San Diego looking for the Russian ships out there. After the refugees were brought aboard, I took some pictures, but as usual, I didn't have my camera with me for the real picture, the one blazed in my mind. As they approached the ship, they were all waving and trying as best they could to say, Hello, America sailor. Hello, freedom man. It's hard to see a boat full of people like that and not get a lump somewhere between chin and belly button. And it really makes one proud and glad to be an American. People were waving and shouting and choking down lumps and trying not to let other brave men see their wet eyes. A lieutenant next to me said, Yeah, I guess it's payday in more ways than one. We got paid today. And I guess no one could say it better than that. It reminds us all of what America has always been a place a man or woman can come to for freedom. I know we're crowded and we have unemployment and we have a real burden with refugees, but I honestly hope and pray we can always find room. We have a unique society made up of cast-offs of all the world's wars and oppressions, and yet we're strong and free. We have one thing in common. No matter where our forefathers came from, we believe in that freedom. I hope we always have room for one more person maybe an Afghan or a Pole or someone else looking for a place where he doesn't have to worry about his family starving or a knock on the door in the night, and where all men who truly seek freedom and honor and respect and dignity for themselves and their posterity can find a place where they can finally see their dreams come true and their kids educated and become the next generations of doctors and lawyers and builders and soldiers and sailors. Love, John. Well, I think that letter just about says it all. In spite of everything, we Americans are still uniquely blessed, not only by the rich bounty of our land, but by a bounty of the spirit, a kind of year-round Christmas spirit that still makes our country a beacon of hope in a troubled world, and that makes this Christmas, and every Christmas, even more special for all of us who number among our gifts the birthright of being an American. Until next week, Thanks for listening. Merry Christmas, and God bless you. My fellow Americans, like so many of your homes, the White House is brimming with greens, colorful decorations, and a tree trimmed and ready for Christmas Day. And when Nancy and I look out from our upstairs windows, we can see the national Christmas tree standing in majestic beauty. Its lights fill the air with a spirit of love, hope, and joy from the heart of America. I shared that spirit recently when a young girl named Amy Benham helped me light our national tree. Amy had said that the tree that lights up our country must be seen all the way to heaven, and she said that her wish was to help me turn on its lights. Well, Amy's wish came true, but the greatest gift was mine. 
because I saw her eyes light up with hope and joy just as brightly as the lights on our national tree. And I'm sure they were both seen all the way to heaven. And they made the angels sing. Christmas is a time for children, and rightly so. We celebrate the birthday of the Prince of Peace who came as a babe in a manger. Some celebrate Christmas as the birthday of a great teacher and philosopher, but to other millions of us, Jesus is much more. He is divine, living assurance that God so loved the world, he gave us his only begotten Son so that by believing in him and learning to love each other, we could one day be together in paradise. It's been said that all the kings who ever reigned and all the parliaments that ever sat have not done as much to advance the cause of peace on earth and goodwill to men as the man from Galilee, Jesus of Nazareth. Christmas is also a time to remember the treasures of our own history. We remember one Christmas in particular, 1776, our first year as a nation. The Revolutionary War had been going badly, but George Washington's faith, courage, and leadership would turn the tide of history our way. On Christmas night, he led a band of ragged soldiers across the Delaware River through driving snow to a victory that saved the cause of independence. It's said that their route of march was stained by bloody footprints, but their spirit never faltered and their will could not be crushed. The image of George Washington kneeling in prayer in the snow is one of the most famous in American history. He personified a people who knew it was not enough to depend on their own courage and goodness. They must also seek help from God, their Father and Preserver. In a few hours, families and friends across America will join together in caroling parties and Christmas Eve services. Together, we'll renew that spirit of faith, peace, and giving which has always marked the character of our people. In our moments of quiet reflection, I know we will remember our fellow citizens who may be lonely and in need tonight. Is the Christmas spirit still alive, some ask? Well, you bet it is. Being Americans, we open our hearts to neighbors less fortunate. We try to protect them from hunger and cold, and we reach out in so many ways, from toys for tots drives across the country, to goodwill by the Salvation Army, to American Red Cross efforts which provide food, shelter, and Christmas cheer from Atlanta to Seattle. Churches are so generous it's impossible to keep track. One example, Reverend Bill Sengel's Presbyterian Meeting House in nearby Alexandria, Virginia, is simultaneously sponsoring Hot Meals on Wheels programs, making and delivering hundreds of sandwiches and box loads of clothes, while visiting local hospitals and sending postcards to shut-ins and religious dissidents abroad. Let us remember the families who maintain a watch for their missing in action. And yes, let us remember all those who were persecuted inside the Soviet bloc, not because they commit a crime, but because they love God in their hearts and want the freedom to celebrate Hanukkah or worship the Christ child. And because faith for us is not an empty word, we invoke the power of prayer to spread the spirit of peace. We ask protection for our soldiers who are guarding peace tonight, from frigid outposts in Alaska and the Korean demilitarized zone to the shores of Lebanon. One Lebanese mother told us that her little girl had only attended school two of the last eight years. Now, she said, because of our presence there, her daughter can live a normal life. With patience and firmness, we can help bring peace to that strife-torn region and make our own lives more secure. The Christmas spirit of peace, hope, and love is a spirit Americans carry with them all year round everywhere we go. As long as we do, we need never be afraid, because trusting in God is the one sure answer to all the problems we face. Till next week. Thanks for listening. God bless you, and Merry Christmas. My fellow Americans, tomorrow is the day for celebration, celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ. Joy envelops us as it must have enveloped our ancestors 1,988 years ago when unto us a child was born. Our joy comes this happy season featuring Hanukkah as well, not merely from the family dinner at which we come together, nor just in the delight that a small child takes in all the sounds and smells and sights and a gift. It's not simply the crackle of a fire, the tinsel on the tree, and the annual viewing of It's a Wonderful Life. Yes, all these things are joyous indeed, but this is also a time for prayer, a time for us to count our myriad blessings and reflect upon the joy that is ours every day of every year. Because of the common stresses and strains of everyday life, we may be forgiven for forgetting from time to time all that God has given us. 
One child has a fever, another is grumpy, a third is asking why is the sky blue, and all the while there are bills to pay and a roof that leaks. Sometimes it all seems a little too much, and at these moments we look back with longing to a time when our responsibilities did not seem so large. But this season, those responsibilities are revealed for what they truly are, the God-given blessings that give our lives flavor and meaning. And the more responsibilities of this kind we have, the greater are our blessings. For in this way we're indeed made in the image of our Lord. At our best, our capacity to love seems inexhaustible. We know at this time of year that all we must do is give of ourselves, and in return, we shall receive all that we have given and much, much more. We know that there are those among us for whom the holidays are painful and lonely. I know you join with me in hoping that this year they will take heart and have faith. For the message of this most joyous holiday is that we are all, no matter what divides us, we are all loved by a force greater than ourselves, a love that surpasseth all understanding, a love that provides all the answers for those who feel lost and alone during these remarkable days. We are not alone. We're never alone. Now here in our country there are children without homes, suffering from dire diseases, whose Christmases will be makeshift at best. But the miracle of human generosity can and does transform the holidays for them. This year, as in years past, your generosity has been breathtaking. Programs like Toys for Tots and literally tens of thousands of local initiatives are examples of this nation's determination to give all children a sense of what the Christmas spirit is and what it can mean for them. I know all Americans have joined with me in grieving for those who perished in the Armenian earthquake. Tragedies of this nature afflict our spirit. It's hard to see why such a thing happens, what it might mean. But the American people are showing us they know they are loved. They know they can renew their strength and rebuild and rededicate themselves to life. We have been witness to the breathtaking bravery of the people of Leninikan and Spitak as they ready themselves for the task of going on. And yes, they will go on, for the Armenian people are made of hardy stuff. As Hazel Barsamian, an American of Armenian descent, says, and I quote, We have a history of this kind of tragedy. We are fighters. We are survivors. We stand together, and we will survive. And at a time of such terrible calamity, something happens in the world, something worth thinking about at Christmas time. For a time, the real differences that divide us and will continue to divide us fall away. Closed borders open. Friends and enemies alike share the burden and hope to help. From Israel and war-torn Lebanon alike, supplies and aid have been sent to Soviet Armenia. And from the United States, the response has been staggering. Relief workers, tens of millions of dollars in private contributions, food, clothing, a cascade of goodwill and fellow feeling. Christmas is the time of the Prince of Peace, and we are therefore reminded yet again that our differences are not with common people, but with political systems. In Armenia, the birth of our Lord is not celebrated until January 6th. It is an Armenian tradition that priests travel to the homes of their flock and there make a special blessing with bread, water, and salt, representing life and substance. This season, more than ever, may the blessings of the priests over the bread and water and the salt provide the Armenian people with the strength to persevere and triumph. Nancy joins me in wishing all of you a safe, sound, and, of course, a very merry Christmas. Until next week, thanks for listening, and may God bless you.